Thank you. Marachuskuski, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Mario Espinosa Kulik. I am a relative of the Purepecha people, what is now known as Michoacan, Mexico. The land acknowledgement that we have prepared for you today reads as follows. In November 2021, the Academic Senate of Cuesta College reached out to the Salinans and the Yaktitutu Yaktilini Northern Chumash Tribal Councils, our local indigenous communities, to ask for their guidance in establishing an institutional process for acknowledging their histories and their relationship to their ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands. The Academic Senate unanimously endorsed the establishment of land acknowledgement land acknowledges resolutions, documents to ser serve as gestures of truth and reconciliation to honor local indigenous histories and their land on which Cuesta College resides. We read allowed this land acknowledgement to humbly offer an acknowledgement of past and present settler colonial violence and our commitment to engage in diligent efforts to nurture our relationships with the Salinan and the Yakti Tutu Yaktilini Northern Chumash tribes. San Luis Obispo County Community College District Slash Cuesta College acknowledges that our campuses occupy the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Salinan tribe, also known as the Tepotala, people of the Oaks, and also the Yakti Tutu Yaktilini, Northern Chumas tribe residing in Tilini, the place of the full moon. We recognize and respect our indigenous communities as abiding and traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples. I'm so sorry. Um, and their traditional territories. Acknowledging their territory where our college resides is an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the indigenous peoples who have been living and working the land from the time immemorial. We acknowledge that California natives and indigenous peoples across the United States have been subjected to settler colonialism in the forms of slavery, genocide, mismanagement of natural resources, and forced removal, particularly but not exclusively in the violent period of the California mission period. Whereas the annihilation efforts of settler colonialism sought to erase indigenous peoples, their languages, and cultural wisdom, we heretofore acknowledge the indigenous history of this unceded land on which San Luis Obispo County Community College District, Cuesta College, is a guest. In so doing, we affirm a more accurate and truthful understanding of our present moment and future opportunities for healing. This unceded land Cuesta College occupies is essential to all of our well-being and community relationships. We collectively understand that land acknowledgments do not by themselves absolve settler colonial privilege, nor do they diminish colonial structures of violence at either the individual or institutional level. We also recognize the necessity that land acknowledgments must be followed by ongoing and unwavering commitments to Native Indian and Indigenous communities. Hence, this land acknowledgment serves as more than an institutional record. It reflects our ongoing practice of honoring, teaching, and promoting greater public consciousness of Native sovereignty and their cultural rights. Dios y mi amo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so before I turn it over to Sharon, I think for introductions, um, I was just going to start by stating that, um, you know, Sharon and I had discussed between the two of us that um, we wanted to be very clear about our own positionality here and that um, neither of us is Native American. We do not come to this group from a place of authority or lived experience there, um, but rather from a place of inquiry and a hope to not participate in the tradition of making Black, Indigenous, and people of color um, educate others about their histories. And so, you know, we, um, Sharon had, had earlier in the semester opened up the possibility for someone to join her in co hosting. Um, and I, my field of study intersects with what we're talking about today. Um, and so I, you know, agreed if, if, um, if that was welcome. And so she let me do that, uh, which I'm grateful for. And so, you know, we just wanted to be really clear about um, uh, where we're coming from. Um, and so by way of introduction, while I'm talking, my name is Ann Jansen, um, and I am a new part-time faculty in the English division this year. Um, I grew up on the Central Coast, but I'm I'm back finally uh, after 13 years out of state. Um, and so I'm very happy to be here and I'm looking forward to um, a rich discussion today. And so Sharon, I'll turn it over to you. 
So I, I would thank you so much, Anne, for introducing yourself and for stating what we were, why we're here and why, what we want to learn and hope to learn from this discussion. Um, I'd like to go around and have people introduce themselves and I'm going to start with Lisa. If you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Mipsid. I teach anthropology um, and I've been at Cuesta for a little over 20 years now. I uh, started out adjunct and then eventually was able to get a full-time job. If any of you remember Bill Fairbanks, I know that's, that's a name from the past. I actually just got to hear him give a lecture the other day. It was, it was very, uh, I miss Bill. Anyways, um, and so thanks for letting me like join in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hyla. I'm Hyla Halfley Kluver. I Worked, I was an adjunct faculty for 28 years, and for 12 years, I was the director of the early childhood laboratory programs at Cuesta College. And I am retired, but I'm still doing workshops through community programs. And I am Selena, and I guess I, that, I want to say that now after reading this book. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Great. Mario? Hi, everybody. Mario Espinosa Kulik, he el, uh, Purepecha, by way of my family. And I am an ethnic studies instructor at Cuesta College. Nanette? Hi, I'm Nanette Pina Stevens. Um, I'm a division assistant in now what is called Institutional Research Grants and Community Engagement um, under Ryan Cartnell and Matthew Green. Um, I, my other departments also include community programs, which is where Hyla is teaching um, for community-based people. And I came into um, seeing this book um, and the, the, the book club itself is something that I was really interested in, in learning more um, in regards to what we, what we should be learning about indigenous people. Um, I am um, Hispanic by birth, um, and I'm just really interested in learning more through reading this book and engaging with you all. Allie? Hello. Hey. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, maybe Allie and then Hallie. Sorry. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm Allie Phelps. I work in the student life office at Cuesta as an activities assistant. Happy to be here. And Hallie? Hello, my name is Hallie Banta. I am, uh, this is my first semester at Cuesta. I am a library tech student and um, I immediately found the book um, when I saw it was going to be one of the library virtual events. I am a Potawatomi. Uh, my mom is from Oklahoma, but we've moved around a lot. So I've felt very disconnected and wanted to know more. And um, I am just very thankful for this book and the way that he approaches um the Native American um experience and um yeah so thanks for letting me join in thank you uh, Tanya sorry I was on mute <laughs> hi hi I'm Tanya Leonard and I am also proud of me welcome Haley I you I'm Prairie Van and since you're from Oklahoma I'm thinking maybe Citizen Van but um I'm Prairie Band Potawatomi, and I have been at Cuesta uh, faculty for 28 years. I was an academic counselor for many years, and now I work in the health center as a licensed marriage family therapist. And um, yeah, when Sharon first asked me, uh, she sent me an email and said, hey, we're doing this book too. And I, at first, I, I have to say, I was a little turned off by the name of the book. I was like, eh. Because, and we use the word Indian all the time in our community, but I tend to not use it outside of my community. Mm -hmm. When I introduce myself, I tell people I'm, I'm Native American or an indigenous woman, and actually I'm just Potawatomi, but people won't know what I'm speaking of when I say that. Um, but we do use Indian. But at, uh, so I, I 
kind of didn't respond for a while until I read the book, but I really enjoyed the book and um, related to much of it. There were a few things that I didn't know that, uh, and, and a lot of it is, is his experience, but um, most of it um, I could relate to and knew. Um, so yeah, and I was kind of excited. I, I really thank you everybody for reading this book. Yeah, I felt, um, I actually, it's kind of a strange experience. I thought, you know, this is the first time I'm gonna talk to, a, spend time with a group of people talking about my culture that are not part of my culture that I actually think understand. Um, you know, I think have, have more understanding than most uh, from reading this book. It was it was very direct. I really like just the direct uh, these questions, and this is the experience. So um, yeah, so thank you for inviting me and um, Sharon and getting me to take a look at the book. And it, it really was kind of a, a nice nurturing thing to know that that's out there for people to learn. Thank you. Um, Julie? Yes, I'm Julie Smith. I'm faculty emeritus. I was a counselor for many years and worked with Tanya, and it's really good to see her today. Uh, when I was reading this book and uh, <clears throat> the author spoke about the Potawatomi tribe and he mentioned it a few times, I immediately thought of Tanya because I remember her talking about her tribe and visiting and, you know, I think you used to go almost once a year back there, you know, and so on. So anyway, and I thought this book was real timely. And I thought it was, you know, a great book. I, I really wish schools would pick it up and, and use it and teach it. I think it would be wonderful. There's so much that's not known, so many stereotypes out there. So, you know, I, I was really pleased. Uh, that this book was chosen and it was available. It was, you know, great to read. Great. And then we have our two Melissas. So Melissa V as in Varla, if you could start first, and then Melissa Boyd. Oh, okay. So Melissa says, sorry, she's lost her voice. So Melissa Boyd, could you introduce yourself? Uh. Intro through chat. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, so Melissa is introducing herself through the chat. She's apparently uh, currently sick and she is living in San Diego and she too is in the library tech program. And then um, Melissa Boyd, are you? Um, I'm she not says sure. in the chat that she's talking uh, about. Is working. Okay. Maybe if you could uh, drop some info about yourself in the chat, that would be great. So um, you know, in listening to everybody's introduction and especially what Tanya was talking about um, with- Karen, oh, you sorry. forgot me. Sorry, Denise, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Denise. Hi, oh, yeah. Denise, I'm a, a librarian instructor at the SLO campus in library technology. Um, thanks for some of our students for coming today and thanks for everybody for putting this on. Thank you. So um, anyway, listening to Tanya talk about you, you know, the word Indian in the title of the book, I was um, reading Debbie Reese's blog and she uh, runs a blog called American Indians and in Children's Literature. And um, she talks about the word American Indian and Native um, American are broad terms that describe the Native nations of people who lived in North America for thousands of years and that recently the word indigenous has come into use too. And many people use those three terms interchangeably, but educationally, but the best practice is to teach about and use the name of a, spe a specific native nation. And then Mario commented in saying that he encourages his students to use native American or indigenous. Well, um, American Indian is a reclaimed term that is used in specific context. It can be easy for non-natives to slip from American Indian into just Indian. So although Troyer uses the term Indian as a native person, it is not appropriate for everyone to use. So I just am curious 
what you think about that and, and your experience with that or what you have to add to that. Are, are you asking just any, anyone? I'm just I, putting it out there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when I heard the, you know, everything you want to know about Indians and was afraid to ask, I thought, oh, I don't know about who wrote this book. <laughs> I totally thought, wait a minute, I, because it can be, but we use it. Um, my family uses it. I was at dinner with my uncle, who is Potawatomi, but with a Caucasian side of the family, the other side, his in-laws, and he kept using the word, uh, he likes to joke around about being an Indian. He's very proud of who he is, but he likes to say Indian like turkey and you know, he's being silly and there was a bunch of children there last night. It was a traditional meal and, uh, and I kept correcting, I kept saying, I, 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 I just wanna make it clear kids, I don't want you to develop any stereotypes from what Uncle Ray says Indian likes to do <laughs> because please don't go out and say Indians do this. This is what Uncle Ray likes to do and Uncle Ray is an Indian. <laughs> I got myself doing that so much at dinner last night. Um, so we use it all the time in, in our, you know, in thinking, but I know that I'm an indigenous Potawatomi woman and I am most comfortable with being referred to that way uh, when the general population, speaking to the general population and educating. And I kind of, uh, through the years, we've moved through all these different things, right? American Indian. First, I was an Indian <laughs> when I was a little girl. And then it was American Indian during, we were very involved in the American Indian movement in the seventies. Uh, my mom, we did a lot of marching and we were very involved in that movement. The book was, uh, I felt like it just the journey that I'd been on, it was interesting, but um, so there was American Indian and then there was Native American and I kind of settled on feeling good with that and, and now indigenous. So, and I think it's happened to all people of color. It's like trying to identify who we are and how do we uh, express to others who we are in a way that they understand and accept us. Uh, and what is correct, right? What, what would really be correct is, like you mentioned, there are, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of tribes, and we are di we are uh, different nations. And um, I'm from the Potawatomi Nation, so yeah. So it is interesting. I worry about that word um, becoming part of a stereotype in terms of how people view us. Um, right, so that that's where that sensitivity came from when I heard that was the name of the book. But I think he does a very good job of um, of answering a lot of questions, and I certainly could relate to and and knew about most of what he spoke spoke about. There were a few things that I was like, oh, I hadn't heard that before. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my thought on the the word Indian. I think it's related to a lot of stereotypes. The term Indian, like my mind just immediately goes to the, um, to India used to describe the people who live in India. So for the sake of like addressing the indigenous and Native American people in North America and South America, I think that can narrow down the group of people who you are referring to and kind of clarifies um, from the people who are Indian. <laughs> um, that's, that was kind of my um, thought process. So I, I feel more comfortable using indigenous and Native American to refer to the people he was talking about in the book. I would definitely agree with both Tanya and Hallie. Um, uh, Native, Native American, Indigenous are often the, the terms that are used interchangeably generally, um, especially among my community and, and, and peer group. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention was that the word Indian brings me back to like kindergarten where my teacher made the brown children including myself dress up as indians and the white children dress up as pilgrims to have a thanksgiving dinner in the middle of the day um and it was wild i was so um like 
taken aback because they made us create our own little headbands with feathers like they made they had these all these like organized plan on how to how to create an Indian in in their curriculum um and so I always am taken back to that memory and sort of trauma where um not only that but the game Cowboys and Indians was an actual game that in my grade people played um where the Cowboys were like the saviors and the Indians were the were the people that they were trying to um subordinate and and capture and so that's that's sort of the relationship that I have to the word which is why I would prefer native and or indigenous yeah Oh, and actually, I wanted to read a quote from Sharon, um, Sherman Alexi on page 15 um, that says, the white man tried to take our land, our sovereignty, and our languages, and he gave us the word Indian. Now he wants to take the word Indian away from us, too. Well, he can't have it. And I thought that that was very powerful in terms of keeping the word within the community, within Native American and indigenous circles, um, because it's a reclamation of an internally used word, but not an endorsement of a general label for Native American and indigenous peoples. Yeah, nice point, because we do use it, or it does get used at home in a very proud way. I mean, when I say I'm a proud Indian, I mean, someone that that's not an uncommon thing to say or, you know, uh, just to speak, to use the word endearingly within the family is, is not uncommon, but, um, but there's still an understanding that, as you said, as you experienced in school, um, and I was pulled out of history very young because I came home and said, um, you know, I learned about us today, Indians, and, um, uh, and I said, and I asked her, um, so are we savages? Because <laughs> that's what it said in the book. <laughs> Uh, and she said, what? <laughs> I said, and this is in the 70s. We're in the midst of the American Indian movement. Um, she marched down to the school and pulled me out of history. And I didn't take it again until college. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, uh, that's the other thing is it's, it's been used so negatively uh, in uh, the general population that uh, it's hard to hear it there. And that whole idea, um, it kind of is attached to that pain of the, the treatment in general of all of these indigenous, indigenous nations that were put together as into one clump and called Indians and then really abused. Um, so there's that too. So it's, there's some conflicting feelings about the word. Well, and one of Mario's comments that Sharon shared about the the way that it's easy for um, uh, non-native peoples to slip from American Indian to just the word Indian, I that's been one of the things that um, I've struggled with. In uh, for I, I've taught um, intro to U.S. ethnic studies on several occasions in the past, and. We always talk about terminology because I don't want terminology to be the reason people don't talk about race and ethnicity. Um, and it often is, I think. But then, you know, we talk about all of this, the students ask questions and, you know, we we spend a lot of time and take a lot of care going over, like, what do you want to know? What are, the, what are the differences between the different terms? And even then it's constant throughout the semester that I'll have to like pause and make the little correction, the little correction, the little reminder here that like, you know, unless you are um, uh, unless you are an indigenous person, this is not a term that you should be using because there's a, a lot of history there. Um, and so it is, there is something about how, it just makes me think about how hard that term and all the ideas it's connected to seems to be for people to let go of. Uh, even just on that, like, you know, not paying attention level, like just the, the habit um, it's so prevalent. Does anyone have anything else they want to add about that to that? Or are you ready for a different question? So um, one of the things that struck me um, in the book um, is that the imagined Indian, you know, that, um, oh, I had the page marked and now I don't know where it is, but that Indians um, 
are so often imagined, but so infrequently well understood. So what does that mean to you? And, and where do you experience that or might see that? Or what, it, what is that? I'm gonna I'm gonna say two things because I why I have been wondering what people who were here first want to be called and that was a really uh, I had to listen to that I listen to audiobooks so I listened to that a couple of times and I like hearing straight from Tanya and Mario the term of indigenous because I've read other books from other countries of people being referred to and they refer to themselves as indigenous and it gives a perspective of where one came from i think more than just clumping it all together and and then second with your question i wrote down a couple of things because for me and imagined whatever i mean we can imagine all kinds of things but we imagine those things from experience and our experiences come from how we're raised and how we're educated. And I think that's a lot of, that's where a lot of these questions came from. So you ask also, did you like the format of how he was answering all these questions? I extremely like that because I think that those questions are always coming up over and over and over and over again. And to have somebody that's actually studied about finding out about how to answer all those questions it was important, but in answer to the imagined part, again, I think it's acculturated. <laughs> we get what we hear when we're growing up, what we experience, Mario's experience right there in his early education. I mean, we've all, I, I grew up in the 50s and the uh, 60s, but we always had to do that at Thanksgiving time. It was horrible. And and even then, when we questioned it, we didn't get any answers because nobody or our teachers were so ill-informed about really what was going on. And, and we've just been learning about how um, what we were educated to believe about Columbus. I mean, there's so much philosophy coming out about all of that and how... Um, I just think I'm thankful for all the indigenous folks that are writing and speaking and and it looks like there's a lot more books. I listened to a couple of interviews anyway. So again, imagine seems to be what we get acculturated with. And now in order to educate ourselves, we have to uh, consider just how we talk. I mean, I've, I've done that. I've had to take a lot of diversity classes teaching early childhood. And when we're with our young preschool children, we're attempting to think about what comes out of our mouths and how we're presenting what's going on as we're working with them or playing with them or thinking about everything that we might be uh, guiding them into understanding about themselves. So uh, again, that's how my feeling about imagine. Oh yes, imagine. <laughs> what, where, where does that come from? You know, what it made me think of when I was reading was that like, yeah, I was exposed to a lot of media that portrayed indigenous people as being really flat. Like they weren't like full people. They were all portrayed in one particular way. And so it made us, you know, imagine stereotypes or imagine not really dive into them being fully human. Honestly, I feel like I was exposed to a lot of movies um, and in books. Cause I read a lot as a kid, you know what I mean? So I feel like I was exposed to a lot of ideas that didn't portray them as nuanced people. And so I guess that's what I thought of when I read that in the book. I think that the reason why the, um, the term imagined Indian is so frequent is because of the way that media has traditionally portrayed indigenous peoples. I mean, I'm thinking about little like movies when I was growing up, like the Indian in the cupboard, Right, where um, they're frozen, right? Frozen in time. And I think that this idea of imagination um, of what an indigenous or native person is, um, is due to what um, 
uh, Hela was talking about, right, about the uh, acculturation of what our culture deems as appropriate to label people, which um, was in the Western United States culture is what I'm talking about, um, in, in labeling who and how people are. Sociologists call this labeling theory, um, but I think that it's deeper than that, right? Thinking about the institutional ways that people can actually show up for indigenous peoples, like for example, changing the myth of Columbus to be like Columbus Day to be Indigenous Peoples Day, um, which only less than 1% of the 3,468 cities in the United States actually do. So there's only 130 states nationwide that recognize Columbus Day as actually Indigenous Peoples Day. So I definitely think that that number can grow. Um, and that, that number suggests that we're still living in this reality where Native and Amer Native American and Indigenous peoples are more imagined than affirmed for their existence. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. It's really this sort of um, image of not even a person, but something that existed in the past. That frozen that you word that you use really resonates. That. Um, yeah, and so then it doesn't really validate who we are and that we're here and that we are, you know, we're Americans, American Indian, if you want to call us Native Americans, Indigenous. We are here and we have uh, a very, very special connection to this land as First People, and um, we are still here. And I, I love it in the book, uh, the way he really talks about how you don't know what a person of color looks like and that's a big problem in our society because we are americans and we are mixed um i have cousins that are blonde haired blue eyed who are just as much native american as i am and i am also you know a fair woman too i have sisters who are fairer than me my mom has much darker skin um so it's um yeah that whole idea that there's this one image and it's not even a real image it's sort of a make-believe almost like an animation or something that existed in the past and then doesn't validate who we are that we're here and that we are part um, of this society and have uh, a right to be here and be who we are Kind of I'm going to play devil's advocate and just draw upon a, a little experience in my life. I lived in the East Coast in New Jersey and Connecticut for three or four years. And there's a very, very, this is a few decades ago, a very, very large Italian American population there. And um, certainly in New Jersey, and I think Connecticut too, at the time, um, Columbus Day was not only a um, an acknowledged day, but it was a giant celebration, uh, a source of pride for Italian Americans, many who were first generation. What's the response to that? Anybody wanna? I have something related to that just locally. Um, here in Santa Maria, there was recently a push to change the logo for the Santa Maria ship um, that many people who showed up to as advocates for keeping the keeping the logo had talked about the Italian heritage that you're mentioning. Um, and in these conversations and discussions, um, it was found that the ship logo symbolically, even um, even though there is like those connections to heritage for Italians, um, symbolically represents the genocide of indigenous peoples because of the contact and confusion by Christopher Columbus, um, which a lot of sources have even um, found that Columbus didn't actually land in the United States. Um, and, and so it's also just perpetuating this myth of discovery when it didn't actually happen. Um, and that's what, the, that's what was found at that meeting for the um, Santa Maria Unified Joint High School District um, and why they've decided to uh, imagine a different logo for the school. Well, and if we think about it, the, the ship's names are Spanish because he was working for Spain, not for Italy. So it's even more mixed up. And changing the name to, and the, the thought around the day to Indigenous Peoples Day doesn't, um, I mean, it's an acknowledgement of 
more of the whole story, right? It's um, it's an acknowledgement of where we are, and I mean, for people who are who who feel connected to Columbus and his um, actions, right? Like all it's asking is for some thought there, and for some um, you know a shift in celebration. So for for school children or for people whose jobs give them this day off, right? It is a holiday. And so to think about celebrating indigenous peoples rather than celebrating Columbus and, you know, all of the things, um, the histories of, you know, genocide and enslavement that he was part of. I mean, certainly he um, did do certain things, but it's, it's asking for just a reconsideration. And a, when you're thinking of what you're celebrating, to, to celebrate indigenous peoples, right? As opposed to um, a man whose actions were, were not after all um, particularly wonderful uh, to, to say the least, right? Um, but it also in that way is not, um, for me, I, I don't think that you could really argue that changing the name of the day to indigenous peoples day is a slight against any group of people, right? Whereas maintaining the day as Columbus day is, uh, there, there are harms associated with that, but shifting the name to Indigenous Peoples Day, there, I don't see a way that that's actually harmful to any group of people. You know, I think that, you know, when you're talking about the imagined Native American and the, um, you know, what's real, from the get-go, uh, Native Americans uh, had genocide practiced on them in this country, I mean, all through several hundred years. And then, you know, from, uh, you know, the Trail of Tears, through the boarding schools, through reservations. And so not just that thousands and thousands died, but then they were ice also isolated on reservations and the culture just, you know, really um, not totally disintegrated, obviously, thank God, but, you know, really uh, hammered. And so then we, when these stereotypes that we're talking about come up and, and uh, Anton Troyer mentions them in the book, they're all from, not from Native Americans, they're from what white folks and white culture think of Native Americans. And that's a disservice because it's not real. And so now it's time, it's way, way, way past time for Native Americans to be able to say, this is who I am. I live in a city, I live in Minneapolis and I work here and, but I uh, observe these traditions and cultures and someone else might be from Arizona, and this is, you know, how I observe my culture here. So I think, and that that is then more of the real, um, you're getting more of the real Native American rather than the, you know, imagined and so on. I mean, I was a little stunned. I saw some of the uh, um, artwork that he pulled from textbooks uh, from the 90s that were pilgrims and I, you know, they were still doing that then and I, I maybe still now, sadly, but, you know, in order for a culture to come to terms with um, what they've done wrong, then they need to be confronted with that. And I think that's uncomfortable for some people because we're experiencing that now with this um, back, sort of almost a backlash. Oh, they're going to be teaching this in school and they're going to teach kids to hate their culture and all that kind of stuff. No, say what's real, teach what's real, not just the history that was whitewashed. And then, and then we can move ahead and not do these kinds of things again. So anyway, so the real and the, you know, and, uh, you know, my friend Tanya, <laughs> You know, let's let's listen to what uh, folks have to say who are Potawatomi, who are Navajo, who are you know Native American, and um, and then you get a sense of realness. I think. Yeah. 
Thank you, Julie. Yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, it's so different. I, I actually grew up as an urban Indian in the LA area. And I went to something called the EONA, which was edu uh, educational opportunities for Native American, which is where I learned to bead and do sand paintings. And I learned about the religion. I went to a Native American church. In the LA, you can go to an, a powwow almost every weekend or at least a couple times a month within the LA, Orange County, San Diego area. So I, I was very much exposed to that. Julie mentioned I, my reservation is in Kansas and she mentioned I would share, you know, going back, we would have an annual powwow. Actually the, the Potawatomis, um, all the nations of Potawatomis, there's some in, um, there's Oklahoma and there's some in uh, Canada and there, there are several bands around and we have a, a, a powwow that kind of moves from nation to nation uh, to the different bands and I would go to those. So, um, but yeah, I grew up, it's, it's very different than growing up on a reservation. I didn't grow up on the reservation. And, um, but my, my uncles, many of them, my grand, all my grandfather and his brothers and my eldest uncles all were, were put into boarding schools. And I definitely feel the effects of that. There's a lot of different religions in my family. <laughs> There's people that are Catholic from the, um, from being put in boarding schools. But so, yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think probably all of you probably learned more in that book I'm, than, uh, than most people know. And we don't teach that in school. Even if we, how harmless would it be to teach that experience in school? What does that say about, that book said nothing about, I mean, it mentioned uh, certainly the genocide and stuff, but it just taught about a people. And why can't we do that more without being afraid um, to be okay to learn about each other and love each other? And I, I do truly believe, and uh, as he speaks out in the book, I mean, I'm mixed. I, I'm also Caucasian. I'm also Chickasaw. My father is mixed too. He's Chickasaw. And my daughter is actually, and, and all the grandchildren are registered as Chickasaw because you have to be a quarter or more to be Potawatomi and they're not because of the roles being messed up anyways there's all that kind of stuff but um I do truly believe that none of us uh people of color have um been able to survive without other good people um that are people of color different nationalities or Caucasians helping us. So I truly believe there are good people. And so I don't see any harm in teaching somebody about what's went wrong and encouraging them to be a good person that kind of helps change the direction of this country and accepting people. I don't get that, that message that if we teach the truth that white children are gonna feel ashamed of themselves. Yeah, they're gonna grieve because you know what, it, it hurts. To hear this stuff, you know, I have a little, I, my, my daughter is half black and I remember her coming home after learning about Martin Luther King and, and just kind of being devastated that she was kind of realizing that there's people out there that don't like you because you're black. <laughs> um, and, you know, I mean that she had to grieve over that and I have to grieve over that, that I have to grieve over that uh, when I got hired at Quest, somebody came up to me and said, aren't you glad you're Native American? And I said, uh, yeah, I'm really glad. I, I love my culture. Uh, but the assumption was that I got the job because of that. And, and that made me sad. And I, and I really like that person that, that said that to me, but that person was ignorant. And so we have to grieve all the time over things that aren't right. And so it's okay to teach our children that things were not right. And it's okay to be sad about it, but it doesn't mean that you're a bad person it, and, and learning about it can help you to be a better person and have compassionate for other people. So anyways, that's, it's, it, as, I, as you might sense, it's, it's still very raw for me and, and probably always will. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing that rawness with us because I, it's important to hear that, you know, you can read it in a book and it's not the same as hearing that and really getting a sense of what that means to, to someone with to what that means and, and to experience that and that lived experience. So that kind of leads me into the next question that um, what stood out or surprised you in this book?
I'll let you think about that for a minute. Um, can I stop? Can I answer? <laughs> oh, yes, please. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I don't think anything surprised me. As I started listening to the book, it sounded like a textbook to me. So I, I, real, I got to thinking as I was listening, because I listened to audiobooks mostly, I wish Truer had been reading it, because after listening to a couple of his interviews, I really liked listening to his voice sharing his own words. But I got educated a little more. So I became more aware of uh, some things that I don't even think about because um, just like with other things, making a joke and Tanya mentioned that her uncle Ray might joke around about some Indian things within family and those kinds of things come out all the time. Anyway, just thinking of Oh, we're going to have a meeting tonight. Well, that can be jokingly because we're having a powwow about this, meaning, oh, we got to discuss something so that we're going to have a powwow. And I, I love the section on terminology. I listened to it three times and then it just kept leading into the rest of everything. And um, so I felt that I was getting a higher education for me. I, like I, I had said, I had taken quite a few classes on. Oh, it used to be called the multicultural, and even how that's taught now is ethnic studies. You know, <laughs> we're, we're going to come up with new terminology constantly because the terminology that we're using may not be appropriate for this point in time, especially when indigenous people are wanting to be recognized for who they are. But there's people all over, and Tanya, thanks for sharing it. You were raised in LA, of course. You know, <laughs> I I wasn't raised. With anything, uh, my background, it was more, I had relatives Sorry, that, that were, oops, oops, So anyway, it felt more like uh, education, but I really learned a lot uh, by listening to it over and over. And I wish I had the book to look at some of the quotes because I, I wanted to listen to them. He started each section with a new quote, so I would go back and hear what those quotes were. Even starting off the first one with a quote from Hitler. You know, it's like, okay, we, we change our thoughts, we change our views, we change our beliefs, but we need uh, books like this. And in fact, this should be a book that everybody has to read. Um, um, the university, I, or the college I graduated from was called Pacific Oaks down in Pasadena. I went there on purpose and because of I liked how they did their teaching. And before anybody could even graduate, we had to take a, a whole uh, semester of uh, understanding who we are, where we come from, and it was called uh, Multicultural Context and Human Development. And nobody could graduate unless we had that class. And we really had to look at how we perceive what we know and how we're going to take what we know. And we learned from each person in the classroom. That's what I felt with Truer. I'd love that he might have been one of my instructors at some point in time. but. Okay, so no, I'm sorry, I've talked too much, but that's what I got. I felt like I got a higher education just from listening to this. So. And, you know, Hila, um Troyer did narrate the book. He is the narrator, so I don't know if you- Well, the know. one version that I listened to, it was somebody else. That um, was, okay. The one I yeah. listened to, it, he was narrating it himself. Yeah. Sharon, one thing I was surprised with was on page 72, the doctrine of discovery that was um, that came from the Catholic Pope. I, I'd never heard of that. I was, I mean, I know that the papal see encouraged um, the slave trade, but I didn't realize it was an actual official doctrine of discovery. So that was what I learned that was new and my takeaway. I remember reading that too, but I've forgotten exactly what it was. What it, what was it, Denise? It was how they dealt with the indigenous peoples and so on, right? Uh, 
Yeah, it was a series of papal bulls, which are um, proclamations, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, in the 1490s, um, the time that gave birth to the age of discovery. Collectively, the messages in the papal bulls are called the doctrine of discovery. And so it basically says it's enabling the slavery and genocide that follows. It says, go forth Catholic countries and take over. And I, we have a historian and anthropologist and other folks. I put a little link that might help in the chat, just if you want additional context. And, and they would approach these indigenous communities and in Latin, they would explain, explain to them in Latin exactly what was going to happen, you know, basically, you know, this is what's going to happen. And it's in a completely different language coming from a completely different cultural context. So. And the author also mentioned that the United States in um, the Supreme Court had referred to those documents in the US Constitution um, as well. So it's kind of interesting that these, um, in, the, in the United States, we have this notion of the separation of church and state, but that we're using these um, documents that are coming out of um, the Catholic Church to, uh, to, to construct our governance. Anybody else want to jump in or want to move on? It's really used to sort of justify the raping of cultures and the genocide, you know, and that's the sad part about it, you know, and, um, you know, as I said earlier about the compassion of children learning, you know, those of us, most, most of us, as he, he states, um, indigenous people are mixed. And so we also get uh, when we don't think it's okay to teach people the truth and allow them to ingest, to, uh, to experience it and resolve it in, in their selves and, and allow them to have grief. It also, uh, I think, forces us as people of color to choose a side. I remember when I was little, sometimes hearing my mom, my, they, my family would talk a lot. They would talk negatively a lot about white people. Um, there's a lot of pain there and I would think sometimes I would say it because I tend to be very outspoken I'm white I would say and they would just say no yeah no you're not you know but I it left me having to dislike a part of myself without uh choosing I had to choose right for many years I I, I dismissed that part of who I am um because it was, it, I, I wasn't, right? I know you, you, when they were saying you're not white, they were saying you're not that bad person we're talking about. But I knew that I was uh, white. <laughs> I knew that my family was mixed. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to be able to uh, be who we are and know that there are good people uh, of all cultures and all, and that a lot of mistakes have been made and we have to own them and learn from them. It took me a long time to kind of look at history, learn about history when I finally started learning because what happened with my mom got mad and pulled me out, which I wouldn't have learned it correctly anyways, but I had to then start exploring it on my own um, and realized, you know, the Underground Railroad and um, the different peoples of colors that have helped each other to survive. Uh, and, and, and be able to say, you know, there, there are good white people out there and, and I can, I'm both and I can be both and I can feel good about every part of who I am. And I think this is what we teach children when we allow them to learn the truth, which the truth includes some good stuff too, right? We can teach them these people made a bad choice and they were hurting people. And these people who may be the same color skin that they are helped to make a difference because it always has been that way. And if we can't say that, um, then how do we learn and have that compassion? So that, that's the other part of that for me is that we have to be able to be proud of all of who we are and not have to choose. I'm only black or you're black and you're not black or there's colorism, right? You're too light, you're getting privileged, you're not getting privileged. It just admit it, 
you know, uh, this is what's happening and how do we correct it? And how do we know that there's good and we have the choice, all of us to be good. Um, so anyways, that's something that's heavy on my heart when I think about all, all of this too. I appreciate what Tanya said. Um, I'm also multiracial. I have Latinx, Black, um, in, in my own um, family context and heritage. And um, I really appreciated a, a lot of what um, uh, Troyer was saying about like the harm that's done to natives who may not be part of a federally recognized tribe um, and the, the harm that's perpetuated um, by blood quantum, right? Which was a, a, a organized effort to reduce the Native American population in the United States. Um, by just de facto, the longer your line gets and with, with um, mixing with other races, you do lose a lot of that quote unquote blood quantum. Um, so that was a strategy to reduce the native population in that way. Um, but at the, other, at the other end of that is that um, a lot of us who are not fairly recognized oftentimes feel invisible and that our experience is not valid or as valid as other natives experiences. Um, and so that's just another harm that's done by the systems of creating recognition, right? Like you're more native than this person and your Indianness is more recognized, right? And, and, and that creates infighting, right? Which is by design what these um, policies do. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that and also mention about my, my family's um, context. And it, it alludes to what um, a scholar, uh, Andrew Jolovit, mentions about and uh, as colonial haunting, right? The way that colonization works even after the fact of um, attempted genocide, that that internalized colonization and the colonization that's um, perpetuated by settler colonialism in the, I, in the mind, right? Of, um, of whether or not you're worth it or you're, you're seen. Um, so I definitely wanted to lift that up and that experience up. Um, and, and agree with, with my um, colleagues here. Um, I think we're at a point where we're, we're going to do um, just a quick prize drawing for um, people that are here. And then we have a, two, a couple more questions after that. So, cause I know some people kind of have to leave around two. And so I wanted to make sure that they were, you know part of the prize drawing and get a little something. Denise. Okay, uh, my random picker thing is acting a little funny, but let's see what happens. Yeah, I had it all set up and now it's sort of like wobbly. But what I wanted to do is we've got some gift cards and uh, these are um, generously provided by our friends of the library group. And what I'm going to do, these are for $20 each. Right away, I want to give one each to our three students that are here today. So that's Melissa V, Melissa B, and Hallie B. And you've got your choice. I have all of your um, emails since you're in classes with me. But you have a choice of an Amazon vanilla card, a Scout coffee card. Scout is a local coffee place. So that may or may not work for you, depending on, I know some of you guys live in Southern California. And then the third choice is a Starbucks. So actually, if you want, just email me at my Cuesta address and let me know which one of those you want. And these will be electronic cards. So once I go in and purchase them tomorrow, they'll get sent to your email. So it's an easy process. So again, that means both Melissa's and Hallie, not Allie. Um, and I think actually Allie had to leave and get back to work. We'll be getting a $20 gift card to one of those choices. Okay, now let's see, I've got um, the rest of the folks other than our presenters on this random name picker, and we can do two more $20 cards. If the name picker wigs out, I will just like, you know, pick a, do it. If I'm in my office, I can ask someone to verify. I'll just put my uh, finger on the picker and announce it if that sounds okay. Sorry, we have to figure out how this goes. Okay, so let's see if the picker will work. Okay, it's, it's actually working. It's, it's got a horrible noise to it. So, um, 
sorry. Uh, Tonya, you are one of our winners. So again, the choices are $20 card, uh, Amazon Vanilla, Scout Coffee, or Starbucks. Have a preference? I'll do Amazon. Amazon, okay. <laughs> and, and that'll go to your Cuesta email. Thank you. Okay, and then, well, thank you. And then I'm gonna do one more, our fifth one. If the picker is gonna help do its thing. Okay, picker, go. And we have Kyla. Actually, you know what? I've won in the last two months. I'm gonna give okay. it back. I okay. haven't even used the Amazon, the uh, yeah, the Amazon or okay. the uh, Starbucks. So, yeah, and let me give it another it. spin. Yeah. Nanette has won. So How Nanette, exciting. Yay. what would you like? Coffee, uh, Starbucks, Scouts, or Amazon? Let's go Amazon. Okay. Thank you, Hyla. <laughs> <laughs> so just to recap, we've got Amazon for Tonya, Amazon for Nanette, and then uh, the Melissa's and Hallie are going to email me of their choices. Alrighty, good job, guys. And thank you, Picker, for working. <laughs> Thanks, Denise. Sure. I'm going to turn this over to Anne. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. I always forget about the picker. Um, so one of the questions that we wanted to ask was um, just sort of thinking locally. So given where we are and, you know, however you think of that, whether it's, um, you know, your neighborhood or whether it's, you know, city, state, um, et cetera. But um, given where we are and whose lands we're on, um, how, what do you see the relevance of Troyer's book or his ideas as being? And, you know, that um, that could be just sort of broadly or it might be in the work that you do. Um, how do you see the, the text being relevant um, or, you know, potentially useful um, or even in your life? You know, I have a four-year-old, so I'm constantly like, hmm, can I use this <laughs> for my kid, you know? Um, so what are your thoughts on that? I so hope that this book will be used in um, schools. It's, uh, you know, I have the young readers edition. And so it's pretty clear. And I really think it would be a benefit um, in high schools in particular, but colleges as well. And uh, I think there uh, was, you know, through my education, I really didn't learn a lot of this until I was in multicultural type classes in college. But there are many people who don't go on to college. And I think people in high school would benefit from learning, you know, even if this book wasn't required reading through the whole book, but a teacher can use a lot of this to dispel myths, to break stereotypes and that sort of thing. I mean, it's really, he's done such great research in uh, this book and um, it's so relevant and so now to day-to-day -day life and the um, general cultures, um, stereotypes and views of Native American culture, you know? So I, I hope it's used in the education system. Yeah, I would have to agree with Julie. I really, it would be wonderful for it to start even earlier in elementary school, because even in my own, just looking at my own past and life and, you know, the education that I went through, you learn all the wrong things about the different types of people. You know, I'm, I am, you know, a Mexican with the last name Pina, which of course people tend to always ask questions about you know where I'm from and and who and what I'm up what I'm about and it's unfortunate for my own self and my own family ties that I don't have the depth even in my own culture that I wish I had and would be happy to share with other people my husband's in the same boat he's Mexican and he's a Blackfoot so there's, he has no knowledge of his own culture. And just looking back at, at my education and going, wow, I was just so 
I didn't get enough of what I really needed and got all the wrong type of information that now as an adult, I can look at it and read these books and have such a more open mind and learn about the different aspects and people's, you know, how many people know that there's so many different nations out there of indigenous people, they have no clue of the depth of even who we work with sometimes. So it would be great for more education to happen that we could all become more open-minded in it. I just um, dropped a link into the um, chat that is to the California History Social Sciences Framework for grades um, K through 12. And I know most of us, I mean, I grew up and my kids with fourth grade doing their mission projects and everything and how much that has changed. And it specifically says in the, rain, um, the framework that building missions out of sugar cubes and popsicle sticks and that things like that is harmful and it should not be done. And so the thinking and the philosophy and the approach to how our history is taught has completely done it completely changed and it's much more relevant and meaningful I think to what's important for our kids to know. I'm gonna just say something really fast because it's happening so much in our county right now with critical race theory being the main topics at two huge school districts in this county. And I, um, I think it's still, should be taught, it just needs to be taught differently, it needs to be taught as the real thing that it is, uh, the real things that happened and how our nation was developed and California and our county. On top of that, you know, I learned about the Chumash Indians in third grade, it was like the regular curriculum that we did, but you're right, we had to make the little igloos and all that kind of stuff. But I still, you know, I, we need more of it, not less of it. And we just need it to be the real, uh, real thing. But again, we've got two major school districts fighting CRT. And I've been watching this closely. It's going to be crazy. I mean, it is crazy already. The parent groups and both, both of those um, that are so not wanting their children to get this information. It's just amazing. But at any rate, I, for those of you that have young children right now, I feel for you because, and that might be why a lot, why it's so important that we have to support families and what they're doing too, and figuring out how we're gonna make that happen. So um, we've gotta find, <laughs> do more ways of teaching how to peacefully teach uh, all children <laughs> about themselves and their families and the cultures that they're growing up in because just one public, system is not going to work but there's going to be huge there are huge challenges to all of that right now so so supporting parents i think is a big thing and how schools can do that will be important um and kind of along those lines just a bit of a personal experience that i had um i have a friend who teaches fourth grade in the Bay Area. And she knew that I teach California Indians and Native North Americans. And she asked me, she says, do you have anything about the local cultures here? And I said, yeah, I said, I've got a lecture on the Pomo. I said, but it's going to talk about the acts of genocide. It's going to talk about the establishment of the missions. And I said, I'm going to give it to you. And of course, you know, you're, you're the fourth grade teacher. I'm not. I said, but, you know, and, and do with it what, you know, what you will. It's, it's yours to have. And she says, I'm going to teach as much of this as I possibly can. And this was this was a number of years ago, you know, before, like you were talking about many of the changes that have happened in the, the K through 12 system. So um, and, uh, you know, Tanya was talking about the fact that there are people out there who are who are trying to do good, who are trying to, you know, educate. And so along those lines, there are some individual teachers out there. Um, who are doing that, and um, she didn't get in trouble for what she included, so that was good. She didn't have any parents knocking on her door, like, yeah. I appreciate everything that's been said about, you know, the the um, the mission project and that that curriculum in the schools. I definitely, when in my generation and schooling, we did make those, but it wasn't out of sugar cubes. They had us, it was in, they had, uh, well, like, you know how your parents help you with your, <laughs> <laughs> so um I remember my mom went to Michael's and like bought all this like this mission set that was out of like cardboard and paper and had like the little mission figures and stuff like that and so I wanted to read 
um, from page 76 about the Chumash, actually, um, at, the, at, the, at the bottom of the paragraph, it says that in California, for example, the Spanish created 21 missions, each with a native slave population, and ran them from 1769 to 1833. Sometimes entire tribes were enslaved, as happened with the Chumash, right? So um, meaning that parents and students were basically duped into rebuilding slave in holding institutions for um, in 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 that system, um, and it, when I went to San Inez Mission the other day um, just to like check it out, there's all these like vague language about what happened, right? Like they're like the Chumash were um, residing in this part of the mission that was conveniently located next to the the laundry, and it was just like oh, it was convenient that they were you know, live next to them. So um, there's not really an acknowledgement of the slavery at the missions um, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that like, it is harmful, right? And it's even more harmful when like, there's, it's a, it's an entire class and you have to like walk around the class and look at all the missions that were created in California um, as a fourth grader, right? <laughs> um, that, that, that's, what, that's what I wanted to mention. Yeah, and building on that, actually, um, I was talking yesterday uh, with Gary Robinson. He's a Cherokee and Choctaw author who's been living at the Chumash Reservation for a, a few decades, and he wrote a series of books called Lands of Our Ancestors that are aimed at fourth graders specifically to sort of combat the um, uh, missions curriculum. And, and he's done this in collaboration with the Chumash Nation and he's met with the elders and, you know, had them um, help him with various versions of the book and make sure that they, um, that they agree with what he's putting out there. And, um, but he, uh, he was telling us yesterday that he um, has been trying to get school districts in the area to adopt this book for this curriculum and or for their curriculum to sort of supplement it and um he has had like some school districts are just straight up not responding <laughs> um, and he said one or two have agreed to adopt it and quite enthusiastically but that um, several of them have said oh absolutely not because um, it comes too close to talking about genocide and talking about slavery and these are children and, you know, that kind of line of reasoning that children can't handle, um, you know, certain aspects of, of life or uh, history. Um, and so he said it's been really, it's been interesting, but also kind of um, disheartening because he thought that, you know, there might be more receptivity to this. Um, Oh, I don't remember who said it, uh, about their, their friend. Oh, Lisa, uh, your friend in San Francisco. So there, it can happen on individual levels, I do believe, because I saw it happen with my grandson, um, who was, uh, he was going to Pacheco Elementary School and his fourth grade teacher made sure that the things that they heard were just, uh, <laughs> even calling it the mission curriculum. We're still calling it that. <laughs> so, I mean, thinking about that and being here from San Luis Obispo and, and Mario's a lot younger than me, got the same thing I got in the 1950s. You know, <laughs> that's what we were getting. So I will look this up. I haven't seen what's gonna be new, but um, wow. So individuals. So even if people t that we know that are teachers, that we can talk to individually. And it might just be little bits and pieces, but, and it's so interesting. We want to protect our young children from things called genocide, but yes, these things happened. And yeah, people have to know. And if we can start with young children, knowing about their, the history of everything, then that they'll be the ones that'll make the changes that are going to have to come along later on. Uh -uh. It's really contradictory because they, we do teach about genocide. We're willing to teach about Hitler in our schools and Germany, but we're not willing to teach about the mistakes that happen in our own country. That's the problem. It, it's we're not asking to do something we're not already teaching. We're willing to say things 
negatively about people from other countries. And we're not willing to admit that we make mistakes here. And we make a big mistake when we teach our children that it's not okay to say we've made a mistake and we've learned from it and we want to do it differently. And until we're able to do that, we will never move to the place that we need to move to, to truly be this multicultural nation that, that we said that was said we were going to be when the United States was developed, when they did steal this land and committed gen genocide, the, their, their mission to have, you know, freedom of religion and uh, people to be able to be who they are will never, ever take place until we can say this part was wrong. We got this wrong and uh, be able to teach our children, but we can get it right. And until we have this whole idea that we're, live, we're gonna hurt them by them knowing that a mistake was made, it hurts so bad to keep secrets. Whether it's in a nuclear family where somebody in the family hurts somebody and nobody wants to talk about it, or if it's an entire country where somebody hurts somebody and nobody wants to talk about it. The only way to get well and move forward and be healthier is to talk about it, admit it, and do something different. So anyways, that's my thing on it. <laughs> Tanya, I think it's, it's that idea too of the, the, the duplicitous nature of what's happening. And then the fact of like, you know, being on the wrong side of history, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's very clear, you know, when you take a look at Hitler and you're like, we were against Hitler and we were against all those atrocities that happened, you know, all those millions mm -hmm. and millions and millions of people that were, were horrifically killed. Like everyone's like, oh, that's very clear cut. But, you know, many of the things that were done to Native Americans, you know, given a blankets that were infected with smallpox, you know, kind of like yeah. you know, many of these things using dogs that use the, the Spanish method to kill Native Americans. And oftentimes you see letters where they talk about the fact that, oh, we didn't use, you know, the method of the dogs, not because it's brutal and we shouldn't have even considered that in the first place, but because we didn't have enough dogs. It's like the, the, you know, some of these things and you hear about this and it makes you physically ill. And these are all yes. things that we should be talking about, but we don't, right? Because you're on the wrong side of, you're clearly on the wrong side of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, and now I gotta say something else. <laughs> oh, I, I'm just gonna quickly really say, last year during COVID, one of my grandsons came and did a lot of his work here at my home because I had a quiet area where he could work. And in his world history class, they were learning about World War I and World War II. And it's got to be from our perspective, but I mean, that's killing, killing, killing. That's what war is all about. It, it's anyway, yeah, my two cents, sorry. I think this book is, has been really great to just open up this conversation and the way that he's, um, been able to just address some really, really challenging, difficult topics as um, someone looking to go into the field of libraries um, as a future library tech, I would feel very comfortable using this book as like a display or um, just even, um, yeah, supporting parents and um, teachers on like a one-to-one -one basis just to maybe include this in the curriculum and to support um, what is being taught in the classroom and just um, seeing what comes of that. I, yeah, I think this book has a lot of potential to um, help some healing to um, happen and um, bring awareness to that. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Hallie, I, oh, okay. Hallie, I, I love what you said about conversation too, because I was thinking about this book and I could absolutely use it in the classroom, but I was also thinking about what an interesting tool it could be for so many people for like, you know, those moments in your life where someone you care about who's in your life says something and you're like, oh, you said that. Okay. Um, and I was thinking about how this is one of those things that like, if you had this 
and you had that in mind and you had this like, oh, wait, I read like he has a response for this. Right. You could like if you remembered it, you could be like, well, actually, like, here's some knowledge or reasoning. Right. But also, even if you didn't have it in the moment, you're like, I have this book. Hang on. And the next day, you know, like, hey, like just to follow up, you said this and I was thinking about it. And here's some ideas <laughs> like thanks, Troyer, you know, like, I don't know, I was thinking about the possibilities with the book just as a, a conversation piece in that way, right, just like for facilitating conversations where like the one on one, like, oh, maybe like a little adjustment of thought there. Um, it's so good. I don't know. I appreciate I that. Perfect, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I appreciate that. And in the class that I teach here at Cuesta, one of them is called Ethnic Studies for Educators with my colleague, Dr. Ren. Um, I can see us using this book in the sections where we talk about um, Native American and Indigenous peoples because it is a conversation starter. It, make, it is inviting to um, discuss and learn more about it. Whereas in academic jargon and like articles from scholarly peer reviewed sources are often intimidating and um, often go into a little, get lost in the detail in the mix of it, where I appreciate the format of this book that is so much easier to, um, to grasp. Yeah, I like what Anne said because of the whole, um, I get a little fatigued with, um, and I know people of color do with uh, <laughs> correcting stereotypes. And so the more we all learn and, um, have some real knowledge that we can say, hey, you know, I think that might be wrong information. Julie, if she's still here, can tell you that she's probably heard me a number of times over the years uh, make corrections to the idea that we were going to have a powwow. Uh, <laughs> they were referring to having a meeting, which to this day is still a problem. I still have to correct it over and over, even in academia. So um, it's, um, yeah, the more people that educate themselves that are willing to speak up and say, hey, oh, you said this. And, and, it, and in a way that it's not, it's not demeaning or hurting anyone. It's just saying, you know, I think that could have hurt somebody. And I know it isn't the intention. And this is the information. So the more of us who can step up and do that, regardless of what they decide or not to decide do in the classroom, it can make a difference. Yeah, and there's a big, you know, a realization for some people that we don't tend to correct people when we should and sometimes they're really clueless and don't yeah. necessarily even realize that i have just said something that could be offensive your powwow that is a perfect example of something that i don't know how many people would have thought twice about that until you mention it in order for them to start thinking and going okay whoa wait a minute, because it was a general term to them, not necessarily realizing what it implied and how offensive those things can be. So I, I, it's the conversation starter has to begin with each of us to be able to have that type of conversation or have that type of, I always, me and my daughter are, are very different in the way that we communicate where she's very passive and I'm more aggressive, where I'm going to challenge what you have to say than necessarily stepping back and just letting you say it. You know, I think about my grandmother. She used to say the wrong things on a regular basis when I had to go, grandma, you can't say that. <laughs> that's, that's offensive, you know, and she really didn't understand it even as a Mexican woman, she could be demeaning to her own. And it was like, stop, <laughs> you, that you can't say things like that, grandma. No matter that you're 95 years old, you cannot say that. So I think it's also having that, the, the strength to be that person to go, wait a minute, we need to look at that in a little differently. So I can see it being a great, starter as long as we've got the guts to stand up to it <laughs> relatedly i think um what happens often too is that when we do stand up for each other or when our accomplices and allies stand up for us there's this vulnerability of status so 
there's been times where our in our righteous indignation is interpreted as anger or um, some sort of vindication. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that, like, yeah, I, I want people to stand up for us and I want people to um, call colleagues in when there are negative portrayals of groups of people being said, but then how do we protect the people who are standing up from actually doing it in the first place? Because I've been in situations where my words and my asks and critiques about language that's being used in a meeting is interpreted as harassment or anger simply because I'm a man of color. Um, but even to like our white allies and white accomplices, they'll be told, you know, that they didn't consent to being called um, to, to hearing what they had to say about what they did was wrong. And I'm I feel so bad to do this with such great discussion. And here we are talking about conversation starters and we're a minute past. And so I'm <laughs> being a conversation ender, but um, I, I, you know, I wanted to be cognizant of time and, and thank everyone for, for coming and for engaging and for sharing. Um, it's, I've, I've really, I'm so grateful to you all that this is, you know, I've gotten to spend my Thursday this way. <laughs> I, yes, I'd like to say thank you to everyone and Denise for your help and Anne for co-hosting with me and Mario and Tanya, you're sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to give you a plug for our book of the year, which That's is right. coming in April. Uh, yes. There, there. This is by Tommy Orange, who is um, of Arapaho and Cheyenne uh, descent. And we hope he'll be here in person. If not, it will be a, the usual Zoom kind of uh, operation. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, we can survive with Zoom. We're excited to have him. And then this is our third um, virtual book of the year for this semester. It's the last one. We've got two of the three picked out for spring. Mm -hmm. In February, we'll be doing 1619, which is kind of the controversial okay. New York Times uh, look at the first boat of, of enslaved people that came to Virginia, the Virginia colony. Uh, March, we're still trying to figure out. And then um, in April, we'll do, uh, we'll have two different sessions. Anne's going to be doing one of them um, uh, there, there. So that's what we've got coming up for you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. I, I know you have to go tutor, I think you said. Yeah, I do. And, and Mario, thank you so much for, I, I saw all the work that you did with the, with that document that Sharon shared. And um, I just wanted to, yeah. to thank you too, because I didn't have a chance. It's so nice to, I know I saw you in like orientation, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's actually engage a little more. So yeah. I, I, I was just so honored to be part of that conversation and to hear everybody's experiences and that they felt safe to share. And I, I feel like Hallie mentioned that she felt she was really, you know, she was nervous about sharing, but she was so glad she did and felt very welcomed in this space. So okay. I, I'm glad that worked for her. Yeah. So. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. And oh, absolutely. The, you know, I was looking you up in our OneSearch, and you have several articles that you've written that have been published. That, uh, <laughs> and so, oh, you probably don't, a lot of people don't know about, but, but. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Right. So. Nice to meet you all. Uh, yeah, nice to meet you, too. Anna. Good to work yeah, with you. Yeah, you as well. It'd be good to get coffee or something sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Down, yes. Okay. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye.